He was an extraordinary Australian. In accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for member statements has concluded. The Acting Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I just wanted your indulgence to make some remarks on the Paralympians who returned uh, from London uh, just this morning. And I had the pleasure, along with the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, uh, the Minister for Disability Services and another of, and a number of other MPs to be there this morning to, uh, to welcome the team. It was a great honour. It was a great honour to see so many of their family and friends there, to see how excited they were, because the success of the Paralympians uh, in, the, in, these, in these Games was truly spectacular. 85 medals uh, in the Games, uh, fifth overall in terms of the medal tally, and of course we beat the USA when it came to gold medals. And this was a team that was uh, particularly excited. Uh, the swimming team, in particular, did very well, and there were some absolutely remarkable individual achievements. And of course, they wowed the crowds in London. But here, the, the ratings were the highest they've ever had in terms of domestic Australian television. So this was one of our best teams ever. There, was, there were a record number of countries taking part, and for us to come in in terms of fifth on the medal count means that they are really well and truly Australia's golden team. They left these shores uh, a few weeks ago with high hopes. They didn't just meet those hopes, they exceeded them by far. They blew them right out of the water. And it was just so pleasing to see all of them there uh, today. Uh, the, the years of hard work and discipline and dedication paying off uh, for so many of the, those athletes this morning. So I think on behalf of everyone in this House, I can truly say we're proud of each and every one of them. Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has the call. Deputy Speaker, it is dreams that inspire people to reach for the skies, dreams of representing our country at sport and dreams of being acknowledged as among the best athletes in the world. Many of us have such dreams as young children, but very few of us reach such lofty heights of achievement. Those that do represent our country are an inspiration to the entire nation as we marvel at the spirit that drives our athletes to greater heights, faster times and longer throws. The Paralympic Games are among the most inspiring sporting events in the world. <coughs> our Paralympians are outstanding athletes who have overcome additional challenges to those that confront all elite athletes. Many of us spend hours watching our Paralympians compete against the best in the world. We cheered whether they won gold and set world records or not. We are all equally proud of all our athletes, as we know they have given their all. Australians watching the Games were taken on the same roller coaster ride of emotions that saw so clearly on the faces of our Paralympians. We shared their hopes and expectations, their triumphs and disappointments, but most of all, we were overjoyed at their efforts. This is a triumph of the human spirit, and Australians are united in our pride at the efforts of our wonderful athletes, and we welcome them home. <coughs> the Leader of the House. Uh, I ask the Leader of the House to move a motion to enable further statements on indulgence on the Paralympians to be made in the Federation Chamber. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The Leader of the House. I move that further statements on indulgence on the Paralympians be permitted in the Federation Chamber. The question is that the question moved by the Leader of the House uh, be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any questions without notice? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. I remind the Acting Prime Minister that there have been seven changes to the carbon tax it promised would never be introduced, five versions of the mining tax, live cattle exports that have been allowed and then banned and then allowed again, and in the last 24 hours, three versions of the legislation banning fishing. How can Australian businesses plan for the future when this government flips and flops, chops and changes and just makes it up as it goes along? The Acting Prime Minister has the call. Well, I uh, thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for that question because it's not a bad attempt to deflect attention away from the savage cuts that are being made to health and education right across Queensland. 
the absolutely savage cuts. 14,000 public sector workers Order. getting the axe in Queensland. Order. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Madam Deputy Speaker, if the relevance rule is to mean anything at all, the Treasurer must be brought back to the actual question he was asked and not this extraordinary Manager attempt to avoid Business his own will incompetence. resume his seat. When questions are asked with so much detail, applying a direct relevance rule becomes quite difficult. I I will ask the Acting Prime Minister to return to the question before the Chair. Certainly. Well, first of all, I was asked about the carbon price, and the government has put in place a carbon price to make sure we reduce carbon pollution and to drive investment in renewable energy. Nothing could be more important to the prosperity of an economy in the 21st century than being driven by renewable energy and by making your economy more energy efficient. And we've devoted a lot of time to that over the past 12 to 18 months. And we've been opposed tooth and nail every day of the week by those opposite. But we've got that done. And that will be good for our economy in the long term. It'll be good for pros prosperity in this country. And it will increase the investment in renewable energy. So everyone on this side of the House is proud of that achievement. And of course, we have put in place new taxation arrangements in the mining industry to make sure, to make sure Australians get the fair share from the resources they own, 100 per cent. But of course, what those opposite have done there once again is to be entirely negative, to oppose everything, because they would rather see our economy fail than see this country succeed. And that is the approach that they take on every issue. Now let's go to the issue of the super trawler. What the government wants to see is a sustainable fishing industry in this country. And the super trawler poses new challenges to our current regulatory framework. So the government is coming to the table in good faith, understanding the concern of all Australians about the activity of the super trawler. Now, as someone who grew up on the Queensland coast, I've spent a lot of time in the water. I've spent a lot of time out there fishing along the Queensland coast. And what I want to see, what I want to see, what I want to see for my children, and what I want to see for my grandchildren, is the capacity to throw a line in and catch a fish. That's what we want to see. And anyone who wants their children and grandchildren to see that will be for sustainable practices in fisheries. But as is the case with the carbon price, what we've got on the other side of the House is a mob of environmental vandals. A mob of environmental vandals who don't understand the importance of sustainability. Sustainability when it comes to the need to invest in renewable energy, sustainability when it comes to the need to make sure we've Prime got adequate Minister's stocks. Prime time has expired. The member for North Sydney on a supplementary. The member for Fowler has the call. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. Will the Deputy Prime Minister outline why it's important to invest in reforms to keep our economy strong? The Acting Prime Minister has the call. I, uh, I thank the member for Fowler for that question because the Australian economy walks tall in the world. Our economy is now 11 per cent higher than when we came to office. And of course, we've done that during a period when many other developed economies have gone backwards. And one of the reasons we are in this strong position is that during the global financial crisis and the global recession, we put in place a range of policies to support employment and to support small business. And we did do this in the face of the worst global downturn in 80 years. And what that meant was we avoided the skill destruction we avoided the capital destruction of small businesses that we see right around the world, which are holding all of those developed economies back. But most importantly, why did we do that? We did it to protect communities. We did it to protect families. We did it to protect small businesses, because we understand that we live in a community. We don't just live in a corporation. And we bring those values towards our decision-making processes. We want to protect 
the, the fabric, the very social fabric of our communities. And of course, to do that, you've also got to invest in the future. And that does mean investment in education in particular, in schools, in vocational training and in universities. And that is why we have found savings in our budget to make room for those priorities over the past five years. We've put in place a responsible fiscal policy, and it's all about making sure Australians have jobs and getting a fair go, not just everything going to the fortunate few. We on this side of the House will always stand up for working Australians. We won't have any part of tearing them down, which is why what we are seeing in Queensland and New South Wales at the moment is so regrettable. The big acts being taken to health and education, having dramatic impacts on the lives and lifestyles of tens of thousands of Australian families right around the country, and the big attack on education spending in New South Wales as well, indiscriminately wielding the axe, cutting the basic services that go to the very basic fabric of our society. Now we know this is just a warm-up act, a warm-up act for Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey because they've got a $70 billion budget the crater. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition, on point of order. The Deputy Prime Minister ought to know by now that you address members by their seat, not by their name. And I find it offensive that he continually, he continually flouts the standing orders, not just in this instance, but quite often. Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Deputy Prime Minister will refer to people by their Certainly. titles. Well, I do understand and the why member they for are... Canning is warned. Deputy I... Prime Minister has the uh, call. Deputy Speaker, I do understand why they are so sensitive, because they are going to take the axe to basic services, and they want to keep their agenda hidden, just like Campbell Newman kept it hidden in Queensland. That's their objective, to have a commission of audit to hide the truth, not to tell the truth. Well, we on this side of the House, we understand you have to build up the nation. We have to, you have to support your workforce. You don't do it by tearing working people down. The member for North Sydney now has the call. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. What is, in the, what is the current level of Commonwealth Government debt today in dollar terms? The, 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 treasurer, the Treasurer has the call. Net debt. 2011-12, 142.5 billion. 2012-13, 143.5 billion. The member for North debt, Sydney has asked 12, his question. Deputy Prime Minister has the call. I also wanted to make some. The Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I couldn't hear when the Deputy Prime Minister said 265. The Deputy Prime Minister will resume her him. seat. The Deputy Prime Minister will resume her seat, and she has just demonstrated amply for me. She has just demonstrated amply for me why everybody on this chamber should pick up the standing orders and read 65B. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call and will be heard in silence. I thank you, Deputy Speaker, because I'm only too happy to talk about debt. Uh, net debt, very happy to talk about it. Net debt in Australia as a percentage of GDP is 9.6 per cent in 2011-12. That is around one-tenth one -tenth of the level of other major developed economies. And why, why is that important? Well, it goes back to the core of the disagreement in this chamber between the government and the opposition. We do have some net debt in this country now, and we have it because the government took the responsible position to support jobs and to support small business during the global financial crisis and the global recession. And the consequence of that action are the strong economic fundamentals that we have, 
and, the, and, and most particularly the AAA credit rating, the gold-plated AAA credit rating that we have from the three major global rating agencies. Now I make that point because here we have is yet another scare campaign from those opposite, seeking to exaggerate levels of debt, seeking to talk down our economy as they have done day after day for the last few years, but all of the time having the shame, the shame of having opposed what we did to make our economy strong, to support jobs, to protect the fabric of our community. And of course, that really gives you a clear contrast between what values those on that side of the House have and what values we on this side of the House have. We'll always support working Australians and small businesses, but those opposite will always take the axe to them. Is the member for North Sydney seeking a supplementary? Uh, yes, on a supplementary. But before, but before I do, I ask the Treasurer to table the document he was reading from. Is is the Deputy Prime Minister re was the Deputy Prime Minister reading from a document? Was the Deputy Prime Minister reading from a document? The member, the member for North Sydney has the call. Thank you. Does the <laughs> nothing to see here. Does a does the acting Prime Minister stand by his commitment on the 21st of May? The government debt will be, quote, within the $250 billion cap. If so, is he ruling out borrowing more to fund the government's $120 billion black hole? The Deputy Prime Minister has Well, here the call. we go, uh, putting forward that shonky figure that appeared on the front page of the Financial Review. It's simply untrue, and I stand by all the commitments we've given. The member for Page has the call. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth. Will the Minister please outline the importance of government making the right choices to support school students and their families? The Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. The fact is that this Labor government has a proud history of investment in schools, but what we build up the Liberal Party is intent exactly. on tearing down. And now we're seeing the biggest cuts to education in New South <laughs> Wales in decades, the biggest cuts since the Liberals were last in power. And these cuts will impact on families, on teachers, on disadvantaged students. And the New South Wales government, I've noticed, Deputy Speaker, all kinds of excuses. The Premier saying yesterday, uh, money doesn't matter in schools. Well, that's wrong. Targeted investments make a difference in schools, but don't take it from me. I had an opportunity to read one of the submissions to the Gonski panel on school funding, and that submission said, and I quote, Australia must increase school funding, at least to the OECD average. It went on. The Gillard government's national partnership investment should be maintained. Many advances will be lost if the extra funding ceases. And who said that? Barry O'Farrell's New South Wales government submission to the Gonski Review. He agrees that we need to invest more. And why? Because it's working. And then he turns around and delivers the biggest cuts to education in New South Wales in decade. The second excuse we've seen, is, the second excuse we've seen, is that they had to cut schools because GST revenue is down. That's also Sydney. completely wrong. And we had the New South Wales Minister yesterday issuing a press release saying he had to cut schools funding because of a huge drop in GST revenue, and he asked me to speak to the Treasurer about it. Well, I did speak to the Treasurer, and guess what? New South Wales GST revenues are rising. Over the next four years, New South Wales GST revenue is projected to rise by 18 per cent. GST revenues in New South Wales are going up while Barry O'Farrell and the Liberal Party cut the budgets to education funding and they go down. Now, the truth is, Deputy Speaker, whatever the New South Wales government excuses, this is all about choices. We choose on this side of the House, as a Labor government, to support investment in education because we know that good jobs in the future absolutely mean and are reliant on a good education. A good education, a good job. So, if you choose to cut funding to school education,
That is a choice that you, as a government, will be judged by. And in New South Wales, all we are seeing from the Liberals is cut, cut, cut. Now, the Leader of the Opposition is famously on the record as saying that he thinks support for government schools is an injustice. Uh, we've got the Shadow Treasurer with $2.8 billion worth of cuts to schools. And we've got the shadow, and we've got the shadow minister for education, who thinks one in seven teachers should be sacked. We build it up. All they want to do the is cut. The minister's time has expired. The member for Page on a supplementary. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, Minister, how's the government supporting schools in my electorate of Page, and what would be the impact of cutting schools funding? The Minister for Schools, Education, Early Childhood and Youth has the call. Well, I thank the member for Page and her electorate. The Gillard government's investment has seen 29 libraries, 19 multi-purpose halls, 42 classrooms, six trades training centres, 9,000 computers, all delivered to the schools in her electorate. The fact is that the Gonski review found that our system is falling behind. And additional targeted investment is needed to make sure that every student can do their best. This government is prepared to act on those findings, but regrettably, New South Wales is going in the opposite direction. And that effect is likely to be felt right across the state. The director of the Association of Independent Schools in New South Wales stating the cuts will mean frontline teaching jobs will be axed or there will be significant fee increases. The director of Catholic schools in Lismore, up to 25 teaching positions could be lost. And in the Northern Star, I thought the most damning assessment of all from a mother with children in local Catholic schools who said, I didn't sleep at night because I know Catholic schools don't make a profit, so their fees would have to rise to reflect that cut. Now, I understand, Deputy Speaker, why that woman is so worried. She's trying to do the best that she can for her children, and it's the same reason that, as Minister and this Labor government, is intent on pursuing a national plan for school improvement. We believe in investing. We believe in building up our schools, but all we see from the Liberals is an intention to the cut them down. The Minister's time has expired. The member for Dixon has the call and should not tempt fate. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Don't be, dis don't be so disappointed in him. He'll give it a go. I refer, uh, I refer to Labor's claim. The member has I, the call. I refer to Labor's claim that it will bring the budget back to surplus this financial year despite collecting less revenue than forecast. Will the government rule out cuts to health and medical research grants in order to fund its $120 black hole? The member for Dixon hole? was warned about props. And I will give the same warning to everybody about the use of props. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. I, uh, I thank the member for Dixon uh, for his question about the Australian economy and about his allegations of a black hole. Uh, the, only, the only black hole that is around is the $70 billion crater in the Liberal Party's bottom line that the Shadow Treasurer announced on breakfast television when he was sitting next to the Environment Minister. But I'd just like to talk more generally about the state of our economy and, and relate that to revenues, because there have been a number of statements in recent times about the strength of the Australian economy, and one in particular that really stands out. And it goes like this. There's no doubt the Australian economy is doing better than most. Our unemployment is remarkably low. Our debt to GDP the compares Deputy very favourably, and on all measures, our inflation seat. is low. The member for Dixon on a point of order. On relevance, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the acting Prime Minister was asked to rule out cuts to health and medical research. He refuses to do that. The he tried to cut it last year. Dixon and this $120 billion the member for Dixon is warned. Abuse of, stand of points of order will not be tolerated. Introduction of argument into questions or points of order will also not be tolerated. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Well, the Shadow Minister has got the hide of a rhino. He, he comes in here. He comes in here and wants a guarantee from me that there won't be cuts in certain areas when he said nothing about the savage cuts in Queensland to health and education from the Newman government. Absolutely nothing. 
He has been completely mute. And the reason every single one of those over there have been mute about the, the cuts Deputy in New South Prime Wales Minister, and in Queensland the is that they have Deputy the stamp of approval Minister of the Leader will of the Opposition. Return to the question certainly, the chair. certainly, because I was also asked about the economy. And I quoted uh, from. Well, I'm sorry. Order. If you can't understand a question from the member for Dixon, you're not going too well. Now, the fact is this. Order. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. I was asked about an alleged hole in the budget, and I'm responding to that by talking about the strength of our economy and our economic fundamentals, and about the commentary about the commentary that our unemployment is remarkably low, our debt to GDP compares very favourably on all measurements, and our inflation is low. Now, who could have said that? Who do you reckon? Which leading Liberal? Which living Liberal leader may have said that? Well, it was John Howard. John Howard said that. So when you come in here to run your scare campaign about our budget, you can't climb over that assessment of the Australian economy, and nor can you climb over the assessment by the IMF, the OECD and most other reputable bodies. The fact is that we have put in place a responsible fiscal policy in this country, and we've done that over five years. We stimulated our economy to support jobs. Now we're coming back to surplus and our economy is growing. What we are doing is paying down debt. That's precisely what a responsible government does in these circumstances, and it's precisely what those opposite can't do, because they've got a $70 billion hole in their budget the bottom Deputy line, Prime and the fact Minister, is they've got an agenda to slash in health and education, just like Prime New Minister South Wales and Queensland. The member for Dixon. Madam Deputy Speaker, I seek leave to table this article showing Labor's $120 billion uh, blowout. Member for Dixon will sorry resume that he refuses his seat. To the member for Dixon will resume his seat. The Leader of the House. Uh, no, I table, I table the media release from entitled New South Wales Bishop's Unprecedented Threat to Catholic Schools from the Catholic Education Commission. The member for Lyon has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for the Minister for Fisheries in another place. Minister, with the fisheries hat on, do you acknowledge the, precau the precautionary principle is already written into the Fisheries Management Act 1991? And if so, in light of decisions taken this week, can you confirm whether you do or don't have confidence in the Australian Fisheries Management Authority? The Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities representing the Minister for Fisheries in the other place. The Minister has the call. Thanks very much, Deputy Speaker. Whether it be because of their legislation or because of their own actions, I do not believe they have been precautionary enough. I do not believe they have been precautionary enough. And, and it has been the case that up until now we have worked the and member people, for Cook is warned. People ask the question. People ask the question from those opposite as to why are we forming this view of AFMA? Well, can I say AFMA themselves in the last 24 hours have reported to the government, have reported to the government legal advice that some aspects of the Act they have been implementing incorrectly. Now, this one, this one is where up until now, and members have heard me say repeatedly about whether or not about whether or not quota had yet been assigned to the vessel. Now, AFMA at their meeting yesterday received new legal advice that a practice they have been following since the previous government was in office and have continued under our government is not actually a one that is consistent with the Act. And so there are some serious questions, and I am pleased, the I am pleased that the, the Fisheries opposition. Minister has called for the root and branch review. We need to make sure not only that a precautionary principle exists in writing, but that it is being implemented and implemented appropriately. There are some areas, with respect, for example, to the target Member species, where I have no reason to doubt that the science on the target species is done thoroughly. But in terms of issues on by bycatch, I am not relaxed about a situation where you always wait for the damage to occur before you decide whether there should be tougher rules. And certainly, in terms of questions which I sought an answer to to work out whether or not Part 10 of the environment legislation would be activated. Where, correct, I hadn't received the information that came in the last 24 hours a week and a half ago. 
But if we want to talk about events 80 years ago, you're the one who thinks the Tasmanian Tiger is still around. So don't you be talking about recent, recent discoveries. We have, we sure have an answer to the, the question. I, I'm sure it the minister the doesn't think I've mentioned the Tasmanian Tiger. No, no, there would only be one member of this you. House that could possibly apply to Deputy Speaker, and I withdraw any reference to you in that respect. Thank you. Uh, the, the question that's asked from the member for Lyon goes to that final question which I sought an answer from when I was working out whether Part 10 of my legislation would be activated. And it was the question of what would the impact on species that rely on the target species be. The answer was we don't have that scientific information, and that was giving a green light to the vessel. I don't believe that's a sufficiently precautionary principle. That's the principle currently being applied by AFMA. When the law falls short, I believe we need to change the law. The member for Capricornia has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Families, Community Services, Indigenous Affairs and Disability Reform. How will a national disability insurance scheme support people with a disability, their families and carers? The Minister for Families, Community Services, Indigenous Affairs and Disability Reform has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the member for Capricornia very much for her question. I was very, very pleased to be in Sydney this morning with the Acting Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition and others to welcome home our Paralympic team uh, from London. Uh, they were incredibly pleased to be home, uh, but also, of course, uh, very, very proud of their achievements. And I know, Deputy Speaker, you're not supposed to have uh, favourites, but uh, my favourites really were the wheelchair basketballers, both the men and the women, uh, fantastic competitors, incredibly tough, and congratulations to them and all of the other athletes who showed that uh, what the Paralympics is all about is hard work, dedication to your sport and demonstrating to not only the Australian people but also the world uh, what extraordinary talent we have in this country. We are, of course, uh, so proud of our Par Paralympians because they are also demonstrating what can be achieved, what people can do even uh, when faced with uh, sometimes very serious disabilities. Of course, this government is also uh, determined to do what we can for those people with disabilities and uh, their carers and families by building a national disability insurance scheme. And in building that national disability insurance scheme, we do want to make sure that we do everything we can to support people with disabilities so that they can meet their aspirations, find what it is that they can do, rather than uh, have the system focus on what they can't do. We believe that uh, Australia does need a disability system. At long last in this country, we will have one, and we're determined to deliver it to end what so many people have called the cruel lottery. The cruel lottery that at the moment says you get a certain level of care and support depending on where you, need, where you live or depending on the type of disability you have or depending on how you got your disability, not on what uh, your needs are. We want to turn that around and make sure that we have a national disability insurance scheme in this country that determines uh, what people get on the basis of need. We've already agreed uh, for the start of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. It will now start in New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania and here in the Australian Capital Territory. So that from the middle of next year we'll be starting, 20,000 uh, people with disability will benefit and of course so will their carers and families. The member for Capricornia on a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I do have a supplementary question. Uh, can the minister update the House on how the government is working with state governments to deliver the um, National Disability Insurance Scheme, and what are the challenges to this, particularly in my home state of Queensland? The Minister for Disability Reforms has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And once again, I thank the member for Capricornia and for her advocacy on behalf of people with disability in her electorate in the central for Queensland. Might be winding back something very soon. His presence in the chamber. The minister has the call. 
Uh, I do thank the uh, member for Capricornia, and as I outlined in my earlier remarks, we are starting the National Disability Insurance Scheme in many parts of Australia. Unfortunately, that certainly won't be happening any time soon in Queensland because of the devastating, absolutely devastating attitude of the Premier of Queensland to people with disability and to their carers and families. Just this week, we've seen the Premier of Queensland slash and burn services uh, in the community sector, slashing more than 300 jobs in the department that's delivering to vulnerable people, including people with disabilities, slashing $360 million from community organisations delivering to vulnerable Queenslanders. And that's exactly what the member for Capricornia, of course, and our other Queensland colleagues are so concerned about. The Acting Prime Minister and I met with people in Queensland, in Brisbane, in, uh, in Brisbane on Ryan. Sunday, and of course heard firsthand about how terrified people in Queensland are about the Premier of Queensland's cuts. Just before I call the member, I'm reliably informed that we have representatives from the South East Queensland Council of Mayors in the chamber today. I welcome them to the House. I'm not sure what you call a collective of mayors, dangerous or persuasive, but we welcome you to the chamber today. The member for North Sydney has the call. <laughs> member for North Sydney. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. If the Acting Prime Minister disagrees with the $120 billion figure for his black hole, does he also disagree with the Director of Budget Policy at Macroeconomics, Stephen Anthony, a former senior person? in the Treasury and Department of Finance, who says regarding your $120 billion black hole, and I quote, there is a hole, fill it, and by the way, stop raising spending promises you can't keep. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Yes, I thank the, uh, the Shadow Treasurer for, for that question. And I'd like to go back to basics here because I think it is very important. Uh, we have put in place a responsible fiscal policy uh, we have set ourselves the objective to come back to surplus in 2012-13, and we're committed to doing that. We're committed to that because our economy is growing around trend. That is precisely what we ought to do, uh, given the strength and fundamentals of our economy, and that's what we've been working on uh, for a number of years since the global financial crisis, when we took the essential steps to support our economy, to support our communities, to keep people in work, to keep the doors of small business open, and of course. We have always been able to find room uh, for our labour priorities, yeah, yeah, yeah. and in some of the most dreadful conditions in, in 80 years, we found room to put in place the most significant increase in the pension uh, in, in many, many years, and we're very proud of that. We've tripled the tax-free threshold, a fundamental reform which really delivers to many people on low and fixed incomes. We've done all those things because we have found responsible savings. Uh, and it's been hard. We've worked very much in the budget to find those savings. $33 billion in our last budget, $100 billion before that. And that's been the methodical, careful approach of the government, which stands in stark contrast uh, to the approach of those opposite, who simply want to slash and burn. And of course, their agenda is to slash and burn like they are slashing and burning in Queensland and New South Wales. And we just hear this afternoon that the Liberals in South Australia also have a new plan that have elected the government. They will cut the public sector by 25. The member for North Sydney on a point of order. Well, Labor just lost a AAA rating in South Australia, mate. So you should be the pretty thankful. The member for North Sydney uh, goes will to raise so I would hope the point would be of order. To the question. The deputy prime minister has the call. Well, of course, the, the shadow treasurer has confirmed yet again that he's given the big tick to all of the cuts in Queensland and New South Wales, and if they are to come in South Australia, because that is the federal Liberal agenda. What we've got here is the Liberal horror show. It's produced by Barry O'Farrell and Campbell Newman, and it's authorised by Tony Abbott, leader of the, the opposition. Deputy Prime Minister. The member for Reid has the call. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Mental Health and Ageing, Social Inclusion and Minister Assisting the Prime Minister on Mental Reform. Minister, as you know, Monday was World Suicide Prevention Day and today is Are You OK Day. 
both of which focus on raising awareness of suicide. Minister, will you inform the House what the government is doing to address suicide in Australia? The Minister for Mental Health and Ageing has the call. Well, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the member for Reid for his question about a topic I know that occupies the minds of everyone in this chamber. Every day, six or seven Australians on average die by suicide, and many dozens more make an attempt. Suicide is the biggest killer of men under 45 and of women under 35. One in four deaths of very young men is through suicide, and shockingly, two or three high schools every week are rocked by a suicide. Certain groups in the community are at higher risk than others in the community to suicide. Indigenous Australians, the LGBTI community, construction workers, families themselves bereaved through suicide, to name just a few, which is why over recent weeks and months I've announced millions and millions of dollars in funding targeted at each of those groups. But in spite, uh, Deputy Speaker, of increased investment in the last term of the Howard government, and in our first term in this area, the death toll through suicide has not shown significant improvement in more than a decade. Monday was sorry. Um, that's why, in the lead up to the last election, the Prime Minister uh, announced that in a second term of her government, we would redouble our efforts in this area, in addition to tackling broader mental health reform. That policy has led to funding flowing, for example, to Lifeline to increase their call capacity from about 400,000 calls per year to 700,000, and to take off the mobile phone charges for mobile calls to that critically important service, to emergency face-to-face -face counselling services for Australians across the country where they are identified by GPs or emergency departments as a suicide risk, to infrastructure projects at notorious suicide hotspots which, for obvious reasons, we don't discuss in precise detail, to a, a crisis outreach service run by Headspace for schools that are impacted by suicide services uh, and more. But we know, Deputy Speaker, that government investment in these programs alone is not going to protect families and communities from this ongoing tragedy. We need a more open discussion in this nation, a more open discussion as a community about mental health, about the impacts of bullying and about suicide. As the member for Reid reminded us, Monday was World Suicide Prevention Day and today is Are You OK Day. Important community initiatives led from the community supported across politics which promote that more open discussion. Today reminds us all, Deputy Speaker, that looking out for each other and taking a short period of time to have a quiet discussion with someone we know who doesn't seem quite OK can have an enormous impact and can save a life. The member for Dixon is seeking a short indulgence. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I want to join uh, with the minister and uh, offer the coalition's full support to the government's efforts uh, in this regard. Uh, I want to praise the government for the investment that they've made and also thank him for acknowledging the investment that the coalition made when we were in government. Uh, the charge of all of us in this place is to make sure that we lift the stigma on mental health. Uh, people who suffer from a mental health condition are no different from people who suffer from asthma or from any other disease. And it is for all of us as a nation to make sure that we continue to put additional efforts uh, into this area, in particular, I think, in relation to Indigenous communities. Uh, and I look forward to working with the government uh, in this space uh, into the period ahead. The member for Wentworth has the call. Thank you. Order. Madam Deputy Speaker, my question is to the Acting Order. Prime Minister. I remind him that in January 2011, the NBN Co took over responsibility for broadband and new housing estates. Will he confirm that by June 2012, 18 months later, less than 1,000 homes and new estates had an active service from the NBN? Can he also confirm that the NBN's rollout is so slow that up to 74,000 such new homes are currently without any fixed line telecommunications at all. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Uh, no, I, do, uh, I do thank the member for Wentworth for that very rare question. Uh, <laughs> and he deserves congratulations. And I'm, it's obviously because the Deputy Leader here is on that he's, he's actually got a question. So I'm delighted to. 
You don't believe in the NBN. I mean, <laughs> the mem manager of opposition business is warned. We, uh, on this side of the House, we do have a commitment to nation building. Uh, we have a commitment to the NBN because we understand the importance of super fast broadband to the modern economy. We understand that we need to have the latest technology so we can deliver super fast broadband and not maintain the horse and buggy system that we've got now. And I think everybody understands there's a basic difference of opinion between this side of the House and that side of the House. They want to stay with the horse and buggy system. We want to invest in the latest technology to make sure that we're not only connected across our country, but we're effectively connected to the rest of the world. And wherever I go in this country, but particularly to regional areas, the NBN is well understood. And even if they're not on our side of politics, they give it very strong support. And what I would say in regard to the specifics of the question uh, from the member, I'm advised that in terms of our corporate plan, our rollout is, is rolling out consistent with the time frames and numbers that we have published, and it will continue to be rolled out. The member for Wentworth on a supplementary. I, ref I refer the Acting Prime Minister to the Villa World housing estate at Mango Hill in Petrie, whose residents have been without any fixed line telecoms for over eight months as they wait for the NBN to arrive. Can the Acting Prime Minister guarantee the NBN Co will connect them before the year is out? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. <laughs> I'm happy to have a look at it. The member... I'm well aware the member for Caldwell is on her feet. I am waiting for some silence and civility in the chamber. The member for Caldwell has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship. Will the minister update the House on the number of refugees fleeing escalating violence in Syria? Minister, what is the Australian government doing to contribute to global efforts to help these refugees, as well as those neighbouring countries that are dealing with the flow of people? The Minister for Immigration and Citizenship has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for her question and recognise her very strong advocacy for the cause of refugees in the Middle East. Deputy Speaker, we have all watched the humanitarian crisis in Syria in horror. 250,000 people have fled Syria for Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan and Iraq. The humanitarian situation in Damascus has deteriorated rapidly and over 100,000 people have fled Syria in the last month alone. Thousands more are fleeing Syria every day, and High Commissioner Guterres expects that a further 650,000 people will leave Syria in coming months, bringing the total to almost one million people. And one of the most disturbing facts about this crisis is that many of the people who have been forced to leave themselves sought refuge in Syria. Over the past 10 years, many people have fled Iraq and have taken refuge in Syria, and they have again been forced to leave and seek refuge in another country. And of course, Australia is helping. We've committed $20 million in food assistance and medical assistance, making us the fourth largest bilateral donor in the world. And today I've announced another significant contribution. As part of the government's decision to increase the humanitarian intake to 20,000 people, I can announce today that we re will, will resettle an extra 1,000 people from Syria. These UNHCR-mandated refugees will be resettled over coming months. This will include both Syrian nationals and members of the Iraqi community who have pre previously been forced to leave Iraq and take refuge in Syria. This includes Assyrians, Chaldeans, Syriacs and Mandaeans. Many of these refugees we resettle will already have significant family links to Australia. This government is committed to ensuring that those in urgent need of resettlement get the chance of a better life in Australia. Many of those who have fled Syria will want to return when it is safe to do so, but many others simply won't be able to do so. Proximity cannot be the determinant of our obligation to help people in desperate circumstances. Deputy Speaker, today's announcement is only possible because of our decision to increase the humanitarian intake to 20,000 people. Our humanitarian program can never 
take all or even most of the people in need in Syria or anywhere else, but we can do our part. And the announcement today says to people in desperate circumstances in Syria that those for whom the Arab Spring has turned to winter have a friend and a supporter in Australia. The member for Mayo has the call. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And my question is to the uh, acting Prime Minister. I refer the Treasurer to the Prime Minister's statement in response to caller Waza uh, on Darwin Radio in June that he could save uh, on power costs by switching off his beer fridge. Why is the government ignoring the Prime Minister's own advice by buying a climate-controlled wine and champagne fridge for the Climate Change Department? How will the government find $120 billion for its budget black hole when its spending is so wasteful? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. I was just trying to figure out which was or it was. We've got a couple. But, uh, I thank the member uh, for uh, his question, uh, and there has been some publicity about these matters uh, in the press, and, and it is the case that the department has been out seeking quotes for white goods and kitchenettes and meeting rooms and, and so on. And I just wanted to, uh, wanted to go through what the department is doing, because this is a very energy efficient building. And I just want to—well, I, I really do Order. understand that those opposites don't understand the concept of energy efficiency. I think everybody in the House actually gets that, and they have proved it yet again. The fact is the that this new building, uh, which has uh, been constructed and the department is moving into, is expected to cut uh, their emissions in half, and it's going to save something like $70,000 a year from power generated by solar panels that, that are on the roof. The so the department Warnham. expects to make $19.1 million in savings from 2011-12 to 2015-16 from the construction of this energy efficient building. And as I've been saying uh, through the discussion today, the government does have a focus on finding efficiencies and savings, and efficiencies and savings have been found substantially within the department, and that will continue to be the case. The member for Gippsland may be celebrating his birthday today, but he's not going to continue to do it in the chamber. He will leave under 94A. The member for Mayo has, is seeking to table a document. Indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm seeking to table the uh, tender Order. document in relation to provision of white goods and associated services for the Nishi building, the which includes the uh, champagne and beer fridge. His seat. Is leave granted. No, and to benefit the member for Mayo from South Australia, I table ABC News report South Australian Liberals keen to slash public sector. The Member for Mayo. He seeks to the same leave. Can you also table the same report which the talks about losing Mayo the triple eight? also leave the chamber under 94A for continual abuse of points of order. The member for Mayo should have learnt his lesson at the beginning of the week. The manager of opposition business. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, on your uh ejection of the member for Mayo, can I just ask how it is in order if a member asks to table a document for a minister to table an entirely extraneous matter, the he could table the telephone book or the election roll, and that makes a mockery the manager of, of question opposition time. business will resume his seat. And the member for Riverina might be able to table anything for much longer if he continues like that. The member for Morton has the thank you, thank you, Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Community Services, Indigenous Employment, Economic Development and the Status of Women. Uh, how is the government supporting disadvantaged families, victims of domestic violence and children at risk of abuse and neglect? Why is it important for all levels of government to support these services and what would be the impact of funding cuts to them? The Minister for Community Services has the call. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Morton because I know that the member for Morton, like many other members in this place, understands the vital role that community organisations and all level of governments play in supporting some of the most vulnerable in our community. 
And of course, this government is very proud of our record when it comes to supporting families, our school kids' bonus, our increased family payments. But we're also doing a lot of work when it comes to vulnerable families. Our $1 billion family support program, $86 million in our national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, and recently $400 million in the second three-year action plan on the national framework for the protection of Australia's children. And of course, this government will continue to invest, Madam Deputy Speaker, to support our fellow Australians in need. But it is really important because many of these programs require not just one level of government alone acting. We all need to work together, all levels of government and the community sector working together on these very important policies. But that's why the cuts in the Newman State budget this week are so alarming. And I just want to run through a few. We've got cuts to mental health programs. Cuts to support for victims of domestic violence. Cuts to family planning. Cuts to rent support. Cuts to women's health services. Cuts to Indigenous employment. And cuts to the Commission for Children. And we know that the Leader of the Opposition and the Liberals have endorsed this plan and these cuts to vulnerable families in Queensland. And why is that? We know it's because if they ever get back into government, they would do the same. They would cut services to community organisations, they would sack workers, and of course they do all this to fill their $70 billion black hole. And the shadow treasurer says natural attrition, of course, would take care of their proposed public sector cuts. But we now know in Queensland that natural attrition means sacking 14,000 workers. Shame. And can you believe that in community services alone, as the Minister for Families said, these cuts, six, uh, $360 million in community services, $360 million. And of this, can you believe $9.6 million is to the Commission for Children and Young People? And this is when the Queensland Government have just endorsed their second three-year action plan on the National Framework for the Protection of Australia's Children, and they're in the middle of a child protection review. But of course, Campbell's cuts go further. $260 million in what the Newman government is calling lower priority projects and efficiency improvements. Well, where is the efficiency in cutting domestic violence services? Domestic violence currently costs the Australian economy $13 billion a year, and Queensland's share of that would be $2.5 billion on a per capita basis. And this is just ridiculous. And of course, we know that Queensland governments right across the country, Liberal governments, are cutting money away from vulnerable people in our community. And of course, this government is getting expired. on with the job of support. The member for Clare has the call. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. I refer the Acting Prime Minister to this newsletter from Lithgow Workies Club that states, and I quote, the bill for the month of July reflected an increase of $4,863 simply because of the carbon tax. We have been advised that many of our supplies' costs will be increasing because the carbon tax will present additional costs with regard to transport and cool rooms and the like. Why should the working families of Lithgow pay for your broken promise not to introduce a carbon tax? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Well, Deputy Speaker, we've seen these allegations day after day after day, and most of them are, most of them are incorrect. But I do say to the member that they should refer these matters to the ACCC, because uh, if, the, if somebody out there in the supply chain is not doing the right thing, then there is a means to deal with that. So they should go straight to the ACCC if he's actually serious serious in the question that is just asked. Well, has he referred these matters to the ACCC? Has he referred what the suppliers are doing to the ACCC? We've heard day after day members from the other side come in here and give us some facts about the impact on electricity bills, and generally they've been found to be wrong. Generally they've been found to be wrong. And the fact is that what we've seen here is a continuation of the scare campaign, which they're pretty embarrassed about now. I mean, the opposition leader went to Tasmania three or four weeks ago and admitted that the sky wasn't going to fall in that things mightn't happen quite the way that he said they would, Wyala being wiped off the map, Gladstone off the map, the whole of the central Queensland coal industry would be gone. We can see that that's not happened, so they're continuing to try and do this in a different way. And the fact is, the fact is that this mob opposite have simply run out of steam. 
when it comes to this scare campaign, and it's leaving them exposed as not having a policy agenda for the future. All they've got is a $70 billion budget crater. That's what they've got because the shadow treasurer announced that on breakfast television, sitting there beside the Minister for the Environment. But he, then he goes on the TV and says, it never happened. It didn't there. happen. Deputy he wasn't Prime there. Minister the invisible will refer, man. return to the question before the chair. The Deputy Prime well, Minister. Well, Deputy Speaker, why we're getting this sort of campaign from those opposite is they're seeking to camouflage the fact that at the core of their whole policy agenda they have very harsh cuts planned for health and for education. Harsh cuts just like we've seen in Queensland, just like we've seen in New South Wales, and what would be seen if the Liberals were in power in South Australia. Deputy Prime Minister we've seen will the resume location. his seat. The Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for McKellar with her new reps practice. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I do refer to the new reps practice and page 568, which points out that with regard to the insertion of directly relevant, it means that you have far more power to make the minister be relevant and that on frequent occasions you ask them to come to the question or sit them down. I note you've already asked the minister to return to the question, which he refuses to do. I would ask you to go to the next step and ask him to sit down. Yeah. Member for McKellar will resume her seat. I'm sure the clerk's very happy someone's reading his new reps practice. <laughs> the Deputy Prime Minister has the call and will refer to the question before the chair. Uh, certainly, Deputy Speaker. I was referring to the fear campaign that has been waged by those opposite on carbon pricing, uh, which has been found to be baseless. And frequently, when matters are raised in this House and we go away and investigate them, we find out that they're wrong. But the member who asked me this question, the member who asked, asked me this question, doesn't even believe in the science of climate change. This is what he's had to say. We're not talking about proven science. We're talking about a climate change theory. So what we've got is a clear Deputy and stark contrast. Prime Minister will refer to the question before well, the chair. What I would say is that he should say to, to everyone in Lithgow that he doesn't believe in the science of climate change, and that is why he's involved in the fear campaign that he is. The member, the member for Clare is seeking to table a very large document. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'd like permission to table both the uh, newsletter and the uh, electricity bill uh, from the Lithgow Working Club. It, um, Member for Clare will not tempt face. The Leader of the House is leave granted. Uh, no, I table the Association of Heads of Independent Schools of Australia media release. New South Wales Government fails uh, students in independent House schools. His seat. The Leader of the House said no at the beginning of his answer. The Member for Clare will resume his seat and put his prop away. The member for McEwen. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations, Financial Services and Superannuation. Will the Minister update the House on the latest Order. research about the causes of workplace stress? Are there any are these examples that support this research? And how is the government responding to this issue, particularly in the public sector? The Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations has the call. I thank the member for McEwen for his question. There's been a concerning report released today that finds that there's a significant and rising problem for working Australians is job-related stress. This can cause long-term damage to health. Nothing is more expensive than sending a good worker triggered uh, by sending a good worker into stress triggered by what happens in the workplace. This can take a heavy toll on staff, on families and the performance of organisations. That is why, where there is stress caused in workplaces by uncaring and deliberate decisions of bad bosses, this needs to be tackled. Labor does not believe it is right and fitting for employers to cause stress for teachers, members of the rural fire service, teachers' aides, firefighters, police, ambulance officers, nurses, cleaners, orderlies. We on this side of the House we appreciate what 1.8 million public sector workers do for Australia. 
We understand that our public servants at local, state and national level deliver services, they deliver care, they deliver trenchant analysis, they deliver emotional commitment and they work very hard. If it wasn't for our 1.8 million public sector workers, Australia would not be as modern, Australia would not be as fair, it would not be as flexible, it would not be as safe and it certainly wouldn't be as compassionate. That is why public sector workers do not require the stress of 15,000 job losses in New South Wales. Public sector workers do not require the stress of 20,000 job losses in Queensland, 10,000 in Victoria, and adding to the arms race, the South Australian Liberals have said they want to get rid of 25,000 public minister. servants in the last half hour. The and, in for and indeed, if those numbers don't appall those opposite, let me quote from the Courier Mail and the Brisbane Times today the voices of the real people affected by these terrible changes and stress. Lisa Rake, Queensland public servant, she received a yellow envelope yesterday saying she was excess to requirements. She's quoted as saying, Newman has stolen my future. That's what he's done. Bernard White is a 56-year-old nurse at the tuberculosis centre at the Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane. He says, I can't give up because the amount of money they're offering me won't be enough for me to retire on. Felicity Davis is a nurse at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. She said, everybody's really unhappy and everyone in our department definitely feels the same way. It's not right. Members of the House, one thing is very clear about workplace stress. Bad bosses cause stress and fear. Liberal governments cause stress and fear. Liberal governments make bad bosses. Or to put another way, if we want to do something about workplace stress in Australia, the three biggest causes are Campbell Newman, Ted Bayou and Barry O'Farrell. Yeah. The member for Fadden has the call. The member for Fadden has the call. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Acting Prime Minister, I refer you to this letter and power bill from Ernest and Marjorie Clark in my electorate that shows their off-peak power has gone up by a whopping 25.5 per cent since the introduction of the carbon tax. They write, as pensioners, we find it hard to cover costs for everyday living, let alone to be hit with increases in power costs above the 10 per cent promised by the Prime Minister. Why did the government mislead Ernest and Marjorie by promising before the last election the that it time would not introduce expired. a carbon tax? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Well, uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. It may have something to do with the $400 per household, which is paid by them to meet Campbell Newman's taxation of the power system. It may have a lot to do with that. Now, we've had a lot of discussion about the impact of a carbon price on electricity. The government has outlined time and time again the impact. Those have been the figures that have been published, and any claims over and above those are simply part of a scare campaign. But I reckon people in Queensland have got a lot to fear from Campbell Newman when it comes, when it comes to electricity as well, given how much he's ripping off and putting into his budget and then transferring on to households like the one in his electorate. And you want to know something? They're pretty cranky about it. The member for Fadden is seeking to table some documents. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I seek leave to table Ernest and Marjorie's bill. And by the way, Campbell Newman froze the, the electricity tariff. The member for Fadden is warned. The member for Fadden will leave the chamber under 94A. The Leader of the House. No, and I table the media release from uh, Lil Liliana Mulacic, JP, the principal of Maryland's High School, entitled A Dark Day for Public the Education of the House in New will South Wales. Resume his seat. The member for Petrie has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Trade and Competitiveness. Will the Minister inform the House of the impacts of the Queensland Government's budget? on the competitiveness of Queensland businesses. The Minister for Trade and Competitiveness has the call. I thank uh, the member for Petrie for her question. As a fellow Queenslander, she uh, is experiencing through her constituents the devastation of the cuts that are being inflicted upon them by the Newman government. Indeed, we know that skills are absolutely essential to Australia's future competitiveness. And yet, the Newman government 
incredibly, has completely axed the Skilling Queenslanders for Work program at a cost of almost $300 million. There has been a recent evaluation of this program by Deloitte, which says that it directly led to the employment of an additional 8,500 people who would not otherwise have gained employment. The increased earnings generated by this employment ultimately contributed an additional $6.5 billion to Queensland gross state product to 2020. So that was a great program axed by the uh, LNP government in Queensland. And what's the federal coalition's view of these sorts of cuts? Well, of course, the uh, Queensland Premier, Campbell Newman, said of the leader of the opposition, I've taken him through it. He's very understanding. He's been incredibly supportive of these cuts. He said, uh, in fact, the uh, shadow treasurer said of Campbell Newman, it was on just the other day, last Friday, all strength to his right arm, all strength to his right arm, that he was absolutely committed to these cuts, that they were fantastic and there should be more of it. Now, what do we have in common? What we have in common is a Leader of the Opposition who is committed to an audit commission exactly as Campbell Newman was committed to an audit commission. They have both done that because there is a $70 billion black hole. And the, the shadow treasurer said, I never mentioned 70 billion. I wasn't there. It wasn't me. He said, therefore, finding 50, 60 or 70 billion dollars is about identifying waste in areas where you don't need to proceed with programs like skilling Queensland sorts of programs. And then the leader of the opposition said, well, this 70 billion figure is a fanciful figure. It's plucked from the air by government ministers, and I'm surprised you're retelling me. And then on cue, the uh, shadow finance minister said, Oh no, it's not a furphy. We came out with that figure, right? That's a $70 billion black hole that they have to fill. And of course, we've got the same shadow finance minister saying, I've got on my desk 49 policy documents with covers, narrative, a list of policies, and the costings. And the truth is, they want to conceal the costings. They won't go to the parliamentary budget office. I'll tell you what you could do. You could go down, go to Aussies. Get a cream bun, get a cup of coffee, and get the costings done all for ten bucks. Because you won't go anywhere reputable to get those costings. Because you know you're going to set up a, an audit commission and inflict on Australia the savage cuts that Campbell Newman, Ted Bailey, Barry O'Farrell, and all of his Liberal crony mates have inflicted on this country. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Yeah, I ask that further questions be placed to the notice paper, please. I understand the member for North Sydney has a question to me. Uh, actually, uh, I want to raise a matter of privilege. 